that is the luck dragon on the uh, bulletin this morning. The, the title of this morning's sermon is The Never Ending Story. Um, it has nothing really to do with the, the book or, or the movie, but it does have to do with the fact that we're coming to the end of our series on Acts. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the story still happens. So we'll go to that. Um, so this week, like I said, it's been a really hard week. There's been a lot of upsetting news, right? Like, I mean, I know I've mentioned it a couple times, but the world's literally on fire right now, right? The lungs of the world, the Amazon forest is on fire. The, the world's also melting at a really extremely fast rate. Um, the warming's not real. Well, yeah. You know, mission gathering, we believe in science and in uh, <laughs> spirituality. Um, in my own personal life, I've been in and out of the ICU visiting my friend this week, and I, I know his family, and I would treasure your prayers. Um, he and his wife and I started with several friends, started a church back in 2007 in a bar on the west side of Charlotte called Revolution, and it was one of the first churches in town to really be vocal about being open and affirming. Um, so if you can think about like how hard it is to talk to your family sometimes about like, hey, like everyone's accepted regardless of their sexuality, um, at your church now. Um, imagine doing it in 2007, right? Um, back then we would always get interviewed at the same time as Elevation. Like, like that's not any slight on them. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's just like we were starting at the same time and I was always jealous because it was like us in a bar, like just a punk rock bar and it was like people had their drinks and a lot of people were smoking and like then like all of a sudden it would be like Stephen Furtick and he's like, we got like eight new t-shirt cannons and I was always jealous of the t-shirt cannons, <laughs> right? But there is like, it was a big church planning time. So I'd, I'd covet your prayers for that because like, it's been rough. It's rough to see anybody you love not able to do all the things that they do and, and a big personality like John, it's really rough because um, he's just 36, you know? 36 year olds aren't supposed to have strokes. Um, but while I was going through all that, his brother recalled a parable about two hands that his dad would always tell, right? And his dad would always tell us this because, like, his dad always loved me, but always thought I was kind of this naive, utopian sort of dude. And uh, he said, Hold out two hands, wait for one to fill with crap and the other one to fill with hope. He didn't say crap, but right, and, and see which one fills up first right? That old chestnut of dad wisdom kept me up all night after I heard it again. Because there's so much going on in this world, right? There's so much going on in our lives. There's so much going on in my life. But for me, the crap doesn't, the crap piling up doesn't mean that my hope and my faith are any less valid, right? We've learned lessons this summer from, from the stories, like different stories from the book of Acts. If you didn't know that's what we were doing, that's what we were doing. Sorry if we didn't communicate that well enough. Um, but we've learned all these different stories from that. And, and we've been searching for what we call the God beyond religion, the God beyond all the rules, the God beyond all the, the, the systems, the God beyond all the like needing to do the right thing all the time or follow the right steps. And we were looking for that space where faith meets reality and leaves behind the need for those rules and regulations. So many of us grew up with religions that taught us everything good and bad is God's will. But Mission Gathering, I don't buy that anymore, right? The God that I worship, I don't believe the God that I worship is causing harm to people he says that he loves or she loves, right? They love. I don't buy that anymore because I don't think all this crap that piles up is a part of God's plan, right? I think that God is working with us in those spaces. Bless you. Goodness gracious. I think that God is working in those spaces. And there's this word that like you've probably heard before. This word is called providence, right? It's not just the school or that part that like, I guess is part of South Park or maybe not Powders. I, what is Providence? I've never understood that name. It's a road. Yeah, it's a road. Yeah, Providence is a road. Well, Providence is this word that like our Presbyterian friends really like to talk about, right? 
predestination, everything's decided. Some of you were telling me about your stories about um, joining Presbyterian churches where once you join, they were like, now life's gonna suck. And I was like, man, that will never be Mission Gathering. Because life already sucks sometimes. We don't need to make it worse. Why would I invite you to something that would make it worse? But providence is this idea that God has a plan and that everything is going to unfold into this great plan and that we're going from the first part of the story to the last part of the story and everything in between leads up to the end of that story, right? But I don't think that's what providence is for me. You see, providence for me is, is, is a much more gentle thing. It's not this strict and rigid plan that it, it, everything is fated and you have no choice in anything and you have no ability to, to move and be creative just as God whose image you're made in is be able to move and be creative. Because God shows up in our stories, right? God shows up in the stories of the Bible. When God shows up in the stories of the Bible, it's not to manipulate. God shows up in the stories of the Bible always in partnership. Because we're, we're called not only to, to allow God to be the author of our story, but to be partners and participants in making things grow and change and move and, 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 and go in different directions than we thought they were going to, right? One of my favorite things about like when people talk about all the craps piling up, I said, you know, that's a great place to grow seeds, right? Any, any of y'all ever farmed before? Try growing without fertilizer? One of the reasons I think we don't always see that, that God is, is, is weaving in and out to make good come out of our stories is because we see our story as the only story, right? Like we, we say to ourselves, like God has this long story stretching through history and, and, we, and we say to ourselves that it's all these people and it's, it's the most good and the most this or the most that, this utilitarian idea that seems to run through American religion for some reason this long story, and, and, and we look at it and we think, oh, well, we're the only person in the story, right? You're the narrator. You're the hero of your own story, right? That's why it's so hard sometimes to, um, to deal with other people because everybody's the hero of their own story, right? Like, um, Jess, was, Jess is feeling sick, and she's, she's watching Mindhunter, like that show, right, where it's like the FBI guy trying to figure out what makes serial killers bad, Right? <laughs> But like, when you talk to people that have done really, really terrible things, they're like, I'm not a bad person. They're like, look at all the things I did to do good stuff, right? Or look at how great I was in this one situation. I think that so often our story becomes this focal point, our little space in the story becomes the focal point, and that we don't see beyond what God is doing in everyone else's stories as well. Like, You know, sorry, um, we don't always see all the aspects of everyone else's story because we're focused on ourselves, but the story of Acts, which we're a part of, our, our own story is a part of a never-ending story. See, get it? That's why the luck dragon and everything. <laughs> I, was, I wanted the um, Stranger Things version, but there's a little too much cussing in that for Sunday morning, right? But the story of Acts in our own story is a never-ending story. One where the making things right, it takes time, right? We want it to go from point A to point B, and we want there to be the final showdown with evil, right? Like, Shirley and I talk about science fiction and fantasy all the time. We love it, because why? Because there's a bad guy, and you're gonna get the bad guy, and then everybody's gonna celebrate, right? I didn't even write this down, but like, if you, if you watch Lord of the Rings, it seems like that's what happens, but you know, the, the hobbits, they help everything, and then they go back, and their home is destroyed, and they have to fight again, and then Frodo's unsatisfied with everything because of all the evil he's seen, so he has to leave, and it's this whole like thing of like, the best stories, it's not so easy, Right? The real stories, the one that resonate with us, it doesn't end with just us. It's an ongoing thing. And it's a thing where we, when we talk about our own stories, we have to be an active participant in that, right? 
Like, it takes work on our part. It takes submitting and saying, yes, God, I'll be a part of remaking this world. Yes, God, I'll be a part of creatively weaving in and out of these things that seem so terrible. But God, I know that you have creatively and wonderfully, and in ways we can't even imagine, created opportunities for change and for grace to take place. So in this last part of Acts, we find what seems to be the worst ending to this story, right? When Acts starts out, it's so exciting, right? The Holy Spirit comes, people have flames over their head, they're speaking all these languages. The last part of Acts talks a lot about boats going from port to port. They're making their way to Rome. And when they're making their way to Rome, it's to put Paul under house arrest, right? Why is Paul under house arrest? Because he has to appear before Caesar to be judged. And so, Basically, he's being put under house arrest to to shut him up and to eventually execute him. But you see, Paul doesn't simply see all of the bad things piling up. No, he is one who's encountered Jesus. Paul knows bad, right? Paul's been through bad. Paul's been beaten. Paul's been thrown in jail. Paul's done terrible things himself. But he really met Jesus, Something he defends in all of his letters because there's all these other people that had met Jesus in the flesh and Paul met Jesus in this mystical vision thing. And he's like, no, I met Jesus. And if you don't think I met Jesus, look at what my life has turned into, right? And Paul sees something else in this time, in this ending. So let's look at his, not in Acts, right? Because that's just going to be the depressing part of like, you know, Paul goes to jail and eventually they're like, well, Paul, will you stop preaching Jesus? He's like, no. And so they cut his head off, right? Um, Sorry, spoiler alert. Um, But let's go to Philippians. And there's debate about when Philippians was written, but most scholars agree this is a letter someone's writing for Paul because his eyesight's failing and he's he's getting older, right? They don't have glasses. Um, And he writes this letter as kind of a farewell letter. But Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 3. Every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. If you want to write a letter to me anytime or an email, you can just go ahead and start it that way, right? That'll make me feel a lot better. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer, right? Hashtag triggered. That'd be good, right? Triggered to prayer. Um, I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I am so pleased that you have continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to the present. There has never been a slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to to a flourishing finish on the day, on the very day, Jesus, Christ Jesus appears. There has never been a slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in who? You would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Jesus appears. It's not fanciful for me to think about you this way. My prayers and my hopes have deep roots in reality. You have, after all, stuck with me in stuck with me all the way from the time I was thrown in jail, put on trial, and came out in one piece. All along, you've experienced me with the most generous help from God. He knows how much, how much I love and miss you these days. Sometimes I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish, and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings. You didn't think you'd hear that in church, right? You need to use your brain and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent and not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life. Live a lover's life. Circumspect and exemplary. A life Jesus will be proud of bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God, the word of God for the people of God. So again, dude's in jail when he's writing this letter, 
right? Paul is sitting in jail when he writes this like love letter to his friends in, in Philippi, right? They're up in like the mountains near Macedonia and he's writing them this love letter while he's sitting in jail. Like, I mean, it may be house arrest, but it's still jail, right? Has anybody ever been on house arrest? Don't raise your hand, right? Um, and he's facing down execution. He's facing the end. His eyesight's failing, like I said. His bones hurt from years of beatings and walking from place to place. I don't know how many of you have ever walked from Judea to you know, Italy, but that's a pretty long journey, right? I mean, some of you might have had that time in college where you backpacked through Europe, right? But don't brag about it. No one wants to hear you brag about it, right? <laughs> But at this moment, he finds hope. He finds hope for himself and hope for this movement that he's created, that Christ has called him to create to spread across the rest of the world, right? Because nobody was leaving that little area until Paul's like, hey, I'm gonna go do this. And so Paul's like, he wants it to spread. He even like, there's some parts of this that we're not gonna read this morning, but it's a really cool letter, Philippians. Maybe we'll do a study on that sometime. But like he even like looks at all the, the haters that he's had. He's like, well, as long as like people are growing and good's happening, who cares, right? He's like, whatever, just let them do it. Let them do it, let's stop arguing. Let's be one church. And he finds hope in this moment, hope for himself, hope for the movement. And it's a hope that he says is rooted in reality, right? I think that's something we we have to explore. His hope is rooted in reality. So often these days, when you talk about hope, when you talk about love, when you talk about joy, when you talk about any sort of thing that goes against this cultural toxicity that we're living in on both sides, right? People that are just angry and they just wanna be angry, like it's, it's hard being a pastor, right? It's hard being a Christian because you have friends that are like on one side that you're just like, ugh. And then you have friends on the other side and you're like, just stop yelling at everybody, right? And so then when you're like, no, I have hope for the future, people look at you like you're crazy, right? People look at you like there's no hope left. But y'all, this morning, I want you to hear that our hope, our hope in Jesus Christ is rooted in reality. It's rooted in the very nature and fabric of the universe, This universe is built on change and hope. It is in constant motion, reformation, and change. So if there's anything that's constant, change is constant. And change with God's gentle providence weaving through, that change pushes us towards hope. That change pushes us towards love. It seems so futile sometimes to find hope in the love for others, but there ain't any other hope in this world than us finding a way to love other people. You see, Paul knew that the story, the real story, it didn't end with his own chapter when that was over, right? Because if, if you don't know, Paul's kind of the hero of Acts. Luke loves Paul. Luke loves Jesus. And then part two for Luke is Paul, right? Because Acts all leads up to really getting us to the story of Paul. I know people don't like Paul anymore. I just feel like they don't read Paul. Um, except for the tiny verses their pastors abused and mistreated. But Paul knew the story didn't end when his own chapter ended. He knew that even his imprisonment, even in that, God was creating opportunities for his mission. How many times, Mission Gathering, I'm going to ask you, how many times this morning have you hit a wall in life? Right? You start running towards what you think is the end, what you think is the goal, and you just slam straight into that wall, right? How many times has it looked like it was game over and the only hope was maybe a small hope, right? I'm gonna be a nerd again. There's like um, Walking Dead, there's the, the, this guy, he's the king and he's got a crack in the wall and he's like, sometimes the cracks form so light can come through, right? that glimmer of light peeks through those cracks. And that's the only thing that you have keeping you going. But then if you can stick with that, right? When you, when you slam into that wall, when, when you can't really see the light, but just a little bit, if you remember that God always has your back, right? God may not fix everything, 
right? God's not like a magic eight ball, right? God's not like a rich uncle that can, I don't know if anybody who really has a rich uncle, right? Um, but they can just send you a check whenever you need it. But God's got your back. Not saying it'll all work out how you want it to, but things you didn't think could come from it can come from it. You see, that's what the never ending story is all about. It's like, actually, to talk about the never ending story, it's the only thing that keeps away the nothing, right? You guys remember the movie? Any 80s and 90s kids in here, right? Like, never ending story. If, if the story's not being read and added to, then nothing's taking over, right? And if, if we don't look at ourselves and say, you know what? God's got our back. God's weaving in and out and through this. That nothingness takes over, and you're just like, well, this is it. This is all of it. The world's literally on fire right now. Why even do anything? Let's just all give up. If we stop adding to this story, if we stop having that faith that, that it's going to keep going, Mission Gathering, this place, this place right here can't allow that to happen. Because you know what this place is? This place is proof. This place is proof that the story doesn't end. My story is proof that the story doesn't end. Like I told you, with like five friends, we started a church in a bar. Nobody would let me preach anymore. Nobody would let me be a youth pastor anymore. And so we started a church in a bar, and we did things that we felt were right. And when that kind of all went away, I thought like I was never going to do this again. Right? Many of you never thought you'd come to church again. And then all of a sudden, three years ago, this place opens up with a vision from a guy who in a little while will be in Pasadena preaching, right? This place opens up and so many of you came in and you were like, yes, like the story's not over. This is a new chapter. We get to do something new. And all the time I see articles about that Christianity's done, like game over. It's all crystals and tarot cards from now on, right? And if you're into crystals and tarot cards, that's not a judgment, right? That seriously is not a judgment. Um, it's just, sometimes I think people that work for online magazines and write articles need to write articles, right? So they always have to come up with something new that's taking over. I, I hear all the time about how the church is dying, and they're not wrong. I want to tell you they're not wrong about the church dying. They're not wrong about Christianity being over. Because the church that in 1619 in this country bought and sold humans as slaves in this nation and received money and support from the sale of those humans, that church is over. That church is dying. That church is ending, right? So many of our great cathedrals were built with the labor, the blood, and the, the money made off of those slaves. The church that told women that they must be silent and submissive and that they need to take the abuse and go back to their husbands has had its chapter. And with all of my life, I'll fight to see that chapter stay ended and closed, but that church is dying. The church that told lesbians and gays and transgendered people that they were outside of God's love, grace, and acceptance, that church is dead. And that church is gonna stay dead. It ain't gonna get resurrected as long as I'm around, amen? The church of empire and colonization that tore through our world and abused our mother earth needs to be done and needs to be over. But the church, the church of grace, the church of love, the church of liberation has only begun to write her story. The church of freedom and compassion is only in her opening chapter. That church that Paul was envisioning when he's writing to the Philippians, it is happening. You see, Mission Gathering, I see a world on fire. But that's not the whole story. I see dry bones laying in great fields, but those dry bones aren't just bones because they're being reborn right now. They're getting up and they're marching. They're being re-enfleshed. I see people who are sleepers waking up, right? I've had this discussion with these friends, like in 2007, we didn't know what we were doing. We were inclusive, but we didn't know how to be inclusive. We're just like, just come on, we'll be the same jerks we are to you to everybody else. Like, and that was a place to start, but like, we're learning, we're finding new things. 
the blind are being restored to sight, not just the physically blind, but the, the, the spiritually blind, the soulfully blind, the people who have turned a blind eye to all of the things that have gone on in their lives for generations, the people whose sight's been restored to see that just because mama told you it doesn't mean it's right. Because the story of this world is not over. The story of Jesus is not over. Because Jesus has not returned yet in the flesh. But you know what? Jesus has returned right here and right now. Because Jesus has returned in each of your lives. When you make the decision to be a follower of Christ, Jesus is in flesh and dwelling within you. The same Paul, the same Paul that gets maligned so much by progressives these days, said that you're the body of Christ. You are, each of you, each of you a part and a piece to that puzzle that is going to remake and rebirth this world. Each and every action you take to dismantle systems of oppression, right? And I'm not saying you can run off and like go change the the US government and systems of white supremacy and systems of misogyny and patriarchy all on your own. You can't do it all. But we do the work, right? We do the work to be the pieces of the puzzle that dismantle those things. And every kindness you visit upon somebody else, do you know what that does? That sets a whole chain of events and energy out into this world that creates healing, that creates compassion, that grows and grows into something bigger. Paul got this. But Paul also knew something else when bad times hit. In verse 12, I want to report to you, friends, that my imprisonment here has had the opposite of its intended effect. Instead of being squelched, the message has actually prospered. All the soldiers here and everyone else, too, found out that I am in jail because of this Messiah. That piqued their curiosity, and now they've learned all about him. Not only that, but most of the followers of Jesus here, meaning in Rome, have become far more sure of themselves in the faith than ever, speaking out fearlessly about God, about the Messiah. What the hurt and hurting people of this world, right? Because that's what we call our enemies. The hurt and hurting people of this world intend for evil, God can bring good out of. It's like a master jazz musician, right? And I'm not the hugest fan of jazz. Sorry, Tim. Um, but I'm learning to like it. It's, it's the free form that gets me. Like, I'm just like, this is all over the place. But I had a friend explain it to me. And, and it's like that master jazz musician that finds that note and brings it out in, in what seems to the uninitiated like chaos, right? that thing that weaves its way through, it seems like chaos, it seems like it's just a bunch of people clanging pots and pans together at some points, but it's not, right? It's not a cat being strangled, (laughs) right? It's actual music, and it's music that once you get to know it, once you get to see it, you can hear it, you can find it, you can love it, right? And That's what God is like in our stories. Right? If you just focus on all the things that are going off and going bad, you're never going to hear what's actually going on in the song, in the story. So God brings good out of the bad, joy out of the sorrow. So take heart when it seems like everything around us is burning down. Because not only is God going to make all things right, this is the best part. You've been invited to take part in making those things right. You've been invited to be a part of healing this world. Our hope is that Christ is the light of the world. And that light, like we sang with Yanni last week, that little light of yours shines through you, right? I had a friend, he wrote a book, and um, it had a really big impact on my life. Um, He wrote in his book, he was like, you know, he always heard that people that are committed to the cause of peace and justice and making change happen, he'd always heard that they were like torches, right? And those torches together, they they form a brighter light. But he was like, I don't think it's like that. He was like, I think it's like cockroaches. Just follow me here. (laughs) 
He's like, you know, one cockroach, you're like, not so worried. You, you go over and you smash that cockroach. But if a hundred cockroaches show up anywhere, it's over, right? So maybe we need to be some cockroaches in this room, right? Maybe we need to not look at our little part of what's going on and just focus on that. But to remember that all of these things we're doing, all of these things that are happening, that our deliverer is here. And right now our deliverer is inside in each and every one of you who chooses to let him shine within you. Mission gathering, we don't have a lot at our disposal as a church, right? We don't have a lot of money. We don't have a ton of people, right? There's pastors in this town that have thousands and thousands of people. But you know what I hear anytime I go out in the community? I'm like, oh, you're the church that does all this stuff, right? You're the church that shows up. Like, I have people that are like, I'm, I'm never going to come to church, but thank you. Like, because they see what you're doing. And our only weapon here is love, right? And our only resistance is joy. Because if you let people rob you of joy, they're taking your ability to write that story, to partner with God in writing that story. Joy is a form of resistance. That's a powerful thing. That's a hard thing to learn as a, as a white man in America. I don't want to harp on that, but like, that's not our tradition. Our tradition is being real sad about how bad we are and then never doing anything about it, right? But joy is a form of resistance. The joy that like, I'm not who I was in 2007 and I'm definitely not who I was in 1992, right? I'm not who I was in the past. I'm not who I was yesterday. I am something new and reborn every day, trying to become more and more like the image of Christ that I want to be. There's joy in that. There's joy in not being who you were. That's why I think when everybody talks about what's the solution to this or what's the new way or what's the new religion, I'm like, man, have y'all even given this an honest try? Not the, not the God of like American Christianity and religion that always seems so rigid and follow the rules, send the tithe and everything's planned out. That sounds more like neo Nordic paganism to me, but we can have a discussion about that at um, coffee with a pastor, right? Um, but have we ever really given a try the fact that like we believe that people can change? That we believe that we can change ourselves? Like not change ourselves, but change also, right? Because Jesus is the one doing the change in us. That grace is something that we actually value. That just because you did that thing, that it doesn't matter. Like, <coughs> excuse me, that God is with us, that God is with you, and that God can do all things, not through our own strength, but through Christ who strengthens us. Like, y'all, I, I just don't feel people are actually giving Christianity an honest try or following Jesus an honest try sometimes. I think that, I think that right now, that joyous resistance is what we need. And our hope, like to go back to my friend's dad's parable, right? We got those two hands. Our hope hand fills up faster than any of the manure this world can throw at us. And also, stop holding out a hand for manure. <laughs> right? That's not your two choices. We have a choice this morning. Our choice is to trust in hope, to be surprised by hope. To know that each breath we take is pregnant with hope. So let me leave you with these last words from Paul. And I'm going to keep that celebration going because I know how it's going to turn out. Through your, faith, faith, through your faithful prayers and generous response of the Spirit of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, everything He wants to do in and through me will be done. So may we be a people who keep celebrating, a people who keep going, a people who delight in the fact that the story begun at the beginning of all things continues on, a love story, a story of liberation. May your dry bones march once more. May your eyes be opened and may our story, 
the story of the acts of these apostles, the story of the universe, be never-ending. May it be so.